<laughs> Man, you cannot make this stuff up. First spin prime test on the orbital launch mount. They're gonna move the huge crane right in front of the camera. It's almost like they're literally trying to block the investigation. What am I supposed to do, Kevin? Well, isn't that what you bought the binoculars for? Oh, yeah, you're right. Hey, is that water? Hey, man, it's super hot out here. Let me get some water. <gasps> oh, no. You see that? Well, that ain't good. Hey, you might want to cover your ears. Man, please, it's like two miles away. Oh. Oh. <sighs> Stage zero. Here, Kevin, take your water back. I gotta go. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yo, take me with you, take me with you. Uh. Yo, stop, 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 hold up, hold up. Damn. Guess I'm gonna have to walk. Around the same time, a small group, including what looked to be Elon, climbed onto the Raptor maintenance stand to inspect the damage of Booster 7's Raptors and engine bay. Good lord, this is way worse than I thought it was gonna be. There he is, E, come here. Look at this. You know I'm gonna have to do an investigation on this, right? Welcome to CSI Starbase. Hey everyone, my name is Zach Golden and welcome to another CSI Starbase deep dive investigation. This week we're going to be doing things just a little bit differently. Instead of talking about all the exciting updates from both Starbase 1 and 2, we're actually going to spend a full hour talking about just one topic. Even though it's been nearly a month since the incident, I still regularly get messages in my DMs on Twitter asking me about the causes of the Booster 7 explosion. It seems like there's still a lot of lingering questions as to what exactly happened here. Initially, I planned to do a short 10 minute deep dive, speculating into some of the possible causes of this event, but I realized that it's not really possible for me to do this without turning it into basically a documentary. There's simply too much background information that I feel like needs to be understood before we can even start to talk about this, so that's what we're gonna do today. First things first, let's build up a little background information by explaining how the mechanical systems of the launch mount were constructed. This is the only way we can truly appreciate the complexity of the system and the incredible amount of work it took for SpaceX to reach the point where they are now. Oddly enough, this investigation actually lines up perfectly with where we left off on this episode almost two months ago, which was basically a Starbase version of the show How It's Made. As a little review, construction on the second orbital launch mount has thus far taken place completely outside of the public's view. We know that it's inside of this SpaceX-owned building, which is known as Hangar M, however, we have not yet seen any photos of its current progress, given that this hangar happens to be part of a military facility. Now, as we get going, I want to remind everybody that the start of construction on the second orbital launch mount for Starbase Kennedy started almost exactly one year to the date after the start of construction on the first orbital launch mount at Starbase Texas. Back when that episode went live on June 23rd, my assumption of the current progress on the orbital launch mount construction was that it likely had reached the same stage shown here in this RGV image from June 15th of 2021. At this point, all 20 of the hold down arms had either been installed already or were just hours away from being lifted into place. If you can't already tell, these things are gigantic. You can see how large they are in comparison to this dolly in the background. Before any of these could be lifted into place, they needed a way to hold all 20 of them at a roughly 45 degree angle while all of the auxiliary components were being installed. For this, a short piece of square tube steel was welded across the inside of the doorway that the clamps were mounted into. Initially, this looked like it might just be a doorstop for the arms to rest against when they were fully retracted. Honestly, this one had me fooled for a while, but the true reason these were installed here was to provide a temporary rigid surface to attach an adjustable length tie rod, which probably looked very similar to this one. You can just barely see it in the bottom right corner of this image. It's really difficult to notice at first because of its positioning. Unfortunately, these are the best ground images I was able to find in order to show this detail. When you look from the aerial view, it's much easier to see them once you know what to look for. Even from 10,000 feet, you can see that each of the arms are extended at different angles. This was before each of the tie rods were adjusted one by one until the top surfaces of all 20 clamps were perfectly level with each other. This is important because SpaceX obviously wants the booster to be perfectly vertical once it's resting on top of the launch mount. 
These tie rods were temporary and only remained long enough for SpaceX workers to attach a special lightweight length simulator for the secondary arm. We are going to refer to the secondary arm as the constraining arm from here on. When the tie rod is removed, the upper constraining arm will make sure the clamp always returns to the same position. I believe the length simulator was used to find the position of where the permanent hinge for the constraining arm should be located. You can see it again here in this aerial view. It appears that SpaceX only had about four of these, so it took several weeks to get all of the real constraining arms installed. Once the correct positions were marked out, crews began cutting out penetrations through the two vertical walls where the hinges would later be located. I think these penetrations allowed them to insert the massive pins needed to connect the hinge and the upper link of the constraining arm. You can actually just barely see one of them through this hole. These should look about the same as the ones on the top and bottom of the hold down arms. Unfortunately, these upper mounting points were very well hidden due to the fact that they're installed up in the ceiling, so it's hard to fully explain what they look like. But after all of the hinges were in place, the permanent constraining arms made up of the two separate links shown here were finally able to be installed. All right, I think it's time we address the other two simultaneous operations that were also taking place while the hold down arms were being installed. So let's circle back to the beginning again. In one of the first images I showed earlier, you could see that once the clamps had been installed, SpaceX workers began to outline some very oddly shaped patterns in between each of the 20 hold down arms. Once all of the outlines were complete, crews used plasma torches to carefully cut through the inch and a half thick steel plate and create 20 giant holes through the inside facing walls. Every day for about a week, there were sparks flying all around the table, as shown in this awesome video by Starship Boca Chica. Once all of this material was removed, I finally began to fully appreciate how complex this launch mount was about to get. At that time, I had absolutely no clue what would go into these gigantic holes. Just a few days after all of these large penetrations were created, two arrowhead shaped door stops were installed into either side of the opening. You can see that even better from this angle. Several days later, brand new backing plates that fit perfectly into the V-shaped door stops were reinstalled into the cutout. You can see that the hold down arms had also been manually retracted into the launch mount using something equivalent to this one and a half ton manual chain hoist. Even though it's just out of sight in this image from Starship Gazer, you can see the tension chain which is connected to the rear wall on one side and a mounting bracket on the hold down arm on the other side. When you look from the aerial perspective, you can see that once the arms were manually retracted into the table, the backing plates were actually permanently welded to the left side of each of the hold down arms. I try to be honest when it comes to these timelines instead of explaining things as if I knew them all from the start. So with that being said, as you can see, this is something I didn't really catch at the time while I was modeling the table myself. It wasn't until I saw this unreal video from Cosmic Perspective as the monstrous structure rolled by the camera the day it was transported to the launch complex when I finally noticed it. Catching this little detail earlier would have provided a massive hint for predicting the function of this system that would later be mounted into this mystery hole. Since the backing plate is attached to the hold down arm, whatever is behind it will only be active while the clamps are deployed. Once the arms are extended, the backing plate acts as a shield for the object above it, stopping any debris or shock waves from below before they can cause any damage. Once the clamp is retracted, the backing plate seals the hole in, well, partially at least. Unfortunately, I never included that in this model because this is where I left off after I got stuck trying to understand another important feature of the mechanical system. This is the hardest part of the entire launch mount to understand, so that's why we're going to discuss it last. As if there wasn't already enough action going on inside of the launch mount, while all of the operations I described before were underway, a third major operation was also in progress. A large crew of pipe fitters could almost always be seen installing several miles worth of stainless steel pipe inside of the already confined space. It was while watching this process when I decided that this is likely the most complicated launch mount on the planet. I haven't exactly had the chance to become this intimate with any other launch pad though, so my opinion might not be worth that much here. Anyways, this incredibly complex plumbing system started off as just a single massive pipe which was laid across the bottom of the launch mount floor. It was mounted just a few inches above the ground to allow it to pass through all of the vertical support walls, forming a complete ring inside of the table. This pipe has a roughly four and a half inch inside diameter, which led me to believe it might be connected to the water deluge system. Shortly after this, crews began installing a smaller two inch pipe, which you can see here is supported by work stands as it's being welded together. This smaller pipe was mounted overhead instead of on the floor. 
At the time, I quickly decided this was probably some kind of hydraulic fluid distribution manifold for actuating all of the hold down arms and the clamps. Looking a little closer, we can see that it's attached to the top of a makeshift pipe rack, which is basically just an I-beam welded to the back wall. You can see that here in an unrendered screenshot from my SOLIDWORKS model that I just happened to save right before that unreasonably expensive software license expired last year. Anyways, over the next few weeks, a few other smaller sets of pipes were also added. These appeared to be tapped off of the main line, but they were capped at the top. Looking through some of the other doorways, you can see more pipes coming up from the floor on the right side of the image. This is a larger diameter than the one seen here, so they're probably for a different purpose. Above that, there was a double T union, which made absolutely no sense when I first saw it. This was starting to get more and more complicated by the day, and once again, I was feeling like I might have to give up here because there was no way to figure out what this pipe arrangement looked like without actually being able to see behind those walls. To make matters worse, one of the first pictures I saw before the structure was transported to the launch complex was this one by Carlos Nunez. Damn, this is insane. Where there used to only be two concentric pipe rings on the inside of the platform, one on the floor and another on the ceiling, there were now five up top and two down low. This is just ridiculous. When we zoom in on the ceiling mounted manifolds, you can see several ports coming off of the four pipes closest to the top. The double T union that we spoke about earlier appears to now be a triple T union, but if you look close enough, you can see that it's actually tapped into the three inch pipe, which is just barely visible behind it. There are 10 of these double T unions equally spaced around the inside perimeter of the table. They are mounted in between two clamps so that the T allows the flow to split in either direction. In between the mounting brackets are what appear to be some type of valve which would allow them to selectively stop the flow to either side. Well, at this point I had officially run out of ideas for what the additional manifolds would be used for. As far as I could tell, nothing more had been done with the mystery holes, so it was pretty clear that there was a lot of work left to do on this structure after it reached its destination. All right, if you guys have made it this far, I want to thank you for sticking in there, because this is where things start to get really interesting. And trust me, all this background information is pretty important when trying to understand what happened with the Booster 7 explosion. All right, so continuing on, this is what the OLM looked like from the aerial perspective when it was transported to the launch site. The reason the launch mount was transported in such an incomplete state is because SpaceX was desperate to finish up all of the work that the LR-11350 Super Crane would be needed for. With the tower complete, the only remaining jobs were to set the launch mount, install the chopsticks, and lift the booster and Starship onto the launch mount for the full stack integration testing. In my opinion, in order to properly test and verify the performance of all of the different systems in the orbital tank farm, launch mount, and integration tower, SpaceX needed to sacrifice a full booster and Starship in the process. So from the very start, I never really expected to see 420 leave the ground under their own power. Saying this on Twitter from the beginning, Upset some people, but it's important to remember that Booster 4 and Ship 20 are the pathfinders for a massive amount of first ever testing events. So let's quickly touch on some of the more important testing events that I think a lot of folks may have not understood the true purpose of. First things first, the launch mount was lifted into place one day after it arrived on July 29th. Not even six days later, SpaceX was preparing to lift Booster 4 onto the launch mount for the inaugural stacking. Yeah, crazy, right? I could not believe they were ready for a full stack in such a short period of time. To complete this mission, crews had to work day and night in order to attach the launch mount onto its base. After the 20-sided platform was lowered into place and properly aligned, workers immediately began performing a single weld along the inner and outer perimeter of the table. You can see where that weld ends here in this image. In the end, it took about four passes to fully weld this table onto the base, which wasn't completed until a few weeks later. In order to stack the booster, there was still a major piece of the puzzle that needed to be put into place. If we look back at the OLM on the day it was transported, the hold down arms were missing the actual clamps that would be doing the job of keeping the 70 meter tall booster from tipping over in high wind or lifting itself off of the launch mount during static fire tests. These were just flat plates that wouldn't be holding much of anything. In less than 24 hours, SpaceX crews added on all 20 clamps. This was done extremely fast, but Boca Chica Gal happened to catch this moment as they were in the process of lifting one of them into place. You can see another one sitting on top of the deck waiting to be installed. With the clamps in place and that single weld completed, SpaceX was ready to proceed with the first full stack test on the orbital launch mount. On August 4th of last year, Starship Gazer was on site to capture the amazing footage as Super Heavy Booster Number 4 was carefully lifted off of the transport stand and lowered into the launch mount. Many of you may have watched this live on Lab Padre or one of the many other live streams from that day. It's important to note that once the booster was lowered into the launch mount and strapped down to the deck, 
The process of actually placing it on top of the clamps took way longer than most people realized. A lot of folks watching assumed it was over long before the job was complete, given how early most of the streams ended. In reality, for close to an hour and a half after this final picture was taken, workers were inside of the launch mount manually deploying each of the clamps one by one using the lever chain hoist we discussed earlier. At this time, there were no hydraulic pistons installed, which would later allow them to automate this process. After all 20 clamps were fully deployed, the booster was then lowered another few inches on top of the hold down arms. Unless you were actually looking for it by scrolling back and forth five minutes at a time, it was almost impossible to notice. This first orbital launch mount test confirmed that all 20 clamps were perfectly aligned with the engine skirt of the booster. Next, on August 5th, exactly one year before the day I wrote this part of today's deep dive investigation, it was time for the super ugly LR11350 to perform the first ever full stacking of a Starship on top of a super heavy booster. In my opinion, this test did confirm that the stage separation mechanism between the booster and Starship were working properly, but other than that, this was mostly just a photo op for the SpaceX team, Starship fans around the world, and of course, Jeff Bezos. All right, hold on. We gotta pause for a second. Did you hit the subscribe button yet? Don't play. Might, while you're down there, you might as well hit the like button too. Really appreciate that. After the booster and ship were taken off of the launch mount the very next day, several important events took place. Without this first event, many other important changes may have gone unnoticed for a very long time, so let's start with that one. Well, I'm sure most of you watching this probably remember the day Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, finally began to release the amazing three-part series where he took a trip through Starbase with Elon as his tour guide. There were a lot of things that we never would have been able to see if not for that video. So thank you to Tim Dodd for bringing this to us. Of course, we should also thank Elon for inviting Tim in the first place. And last but certainly not least, we should thank Sam Patel, Senior Director of Starship Operations for helping us understand the purpose of that mystery hole that we were discussing a few minutes ago. As it turns out, this is actually one of the most important features of the entire Starship design. This is the entire reason Elon referred to the tank farm and the launch mount as stage zero for the first time during this interview. He never explained this part the first time around, but thanks to Sam Patel, I was able to piece together what was going on here nearly a full year before it was ever mentioned publicly by Elon or SpaceX. There was a massive amount of information dished out here in an extremely short period of time, so I'm going to quickly walk you through a few key moments of this interaction. As I mentioned earlier, the holy grail moment of this three-part tour came when Sam Patel was introduced immediately after Elon and Tim arrived to the launch complex. As Elon approaches where they're standing near this massive structure waiting to be lifted, you can see Sam on the right side waiting anxiously. My first impression of Sam was... Cool. Hey, Sam. Hey. Hi, Sam. Thanks, Zero. Hey. Hell yeah. Uh, cool. How's it going, guys? All right. Actually, Why the hell is this guy so excited right now? He looked like someone who just had a really big secret to tell and couldn't hold it any longer. Let's just say he had my attention. Once Elon and crew reach the top of the stairs for the base of the launch mount, we get our first piece of interesting information. All right, the jacks that we got. So on top of that column right there, there's some shim plates. We believe we're off by half an inch. Half an inch? Like Damn. the okay. plane. So what these guys have done, they added- For those of you who don't understand what they're discussing here, let me translate. Essentially, the top of the base structure for the launch mount was not perfectly level, meaning that once the table was placed on top, it would be tilting to one side. To fix this, they had to place shims in between the two surfaces in order to allow one side to be raised up in an attempt to even things out. I imagine that leveling off a 20-sided structure of this size is not an easy task. You can tell Elon seemed a little bothered by this as well. This is just my opinion, but I don't think they ever truly got it leveled off. The reason I say that is because of this video, where I first realized that the booster had a bit of a lean to it while it was standing unsupported on the launch mount. As I've mentioned on a previous episode, it was pretty clear that once the claws on the upper stage GSE arm engaged the booster for the first time, you can see the claw push the booster back into a vertical position. Anyways, let's listen to this next clip. Yeah, it takes a long time to weld thick steel. Yeah, I mean, this is gonna be a one inch weld, weld here, all yeah. the way around inside and outside. One pass on the inside and outside, just, just one weld pass, will get us 40 miles per hour on, on booster and ship. Okay. 
This confused me the first few times I listened to it, but what Sam is explaining here in a roundabout way is that the significant amount of welding work required to sufficiently attach the launch mount onto the base was not going to be completed by the time they planned to do the first full stack. To compensate, they planned to do just a single pass and then come back to complete the remaining welds after the full stack test was completed. Mm. Once I let that sink in for the first time, I thought that was super sketchy. But Sam reassures Elon that from a structural integrity standpoint, everything gonna be fine because the single pass weld should be enough to hold down a booster and a starship without them tilting over and ripping the deck off of the base. He mentions that the current safety rating for the full stack is 40 mile an hour. Now I'm not sure if this actually scales linearly, but if they perform three welding passes in total, let's keep in mind that I believe there were at least five, that would mean the launch mount with full stack on top is able to withstand a headwind of somewhere between 120 and 200 miles an hour. So to put that into perspective, a category five hurricane has a wind speed 157 miles or greater. So if they wanted to protect against the worst possible weather situation they could ever run into, I think that five pass estimate sounds just about right. Okay, look, I'm sorry for slipping into that random accent there, but sometimes I can't help it when I get excited. This is literally my favorite part of the entire Everyday Astronaut Starbase tour coming up right here next. Honestly, I've been waiting for close to a year to talk about this, so let's not waste any more time. As before, let's start off with listening to what Sam has to say about what is clearly his favorite feature of Stage Zero as well. Um, again, it's all bonus time work in terms of fluids routing, and those are the hoods, so when the QDs retract on the hold downs, the top interface is that hold down hood, or sorry, the QD hood, and so it clamshells back in. It's all through like just a strut, not, not, a, not a dynamic system on its own. The, the hold down hydraulic actuator actuates the hold down, yeah. the QD, and, and the hood all, all together. Say what? Can you repeat that again? Yeah. The QD. Yeah. QD stands for quick disconnect. At this point, we all knew they would need one to fuel the booster and also one for the ship. But by the sound of it, these ones are connected both to the hold down clamps and some kind of hood? I wasn't really sure what to make of this at the time. As soon as the final episode of the trilogy ended, I popped open my archive of RGV aerial photos and went searching for anything that could possibly be considered a, a QD. I scanned through three weeks of photos and the area I always looked to first was the ground fabrication building, which is where the launch mount was constructed in the first place. Since the launch mount was moved before it was completely ready, it only made sense that we should still be able to find new parts for it over there. Finally, in the July 28th photo group, from the day the table was moved, I stumbled onto something that looked promising. Only problem was that the view was so far away. I scanned through picture after picture trying to see it better. Too far away. Damn it, if only this one was just a little bit further down. Ah, oh, come on. If this was just a little bit more to the right, we would have it now. Literally inches. Inches to the left. I need to find a way to get hold of this RGV guy and see if he's doing this on purpose. I mean, is he getting paid by SpaceX not to show this area? Finally, on image number 100, when I was just about to give up hope, jackpot. After a quick count using my fingers and toes, sure enough, there were one, two, three, seven, fifteen, yep, twenty of them. Could these be the QDs that Sam was talking about? Or is this just the hydraulic cylinder which would later be used to automatically extend and retract the hold down arms? I felt like I had seen these before, but I couldn't remember where, and then it hit me. Oh yeah, it was that tweet from Nick Ann Sweeney. No one knew what it was at the time, but now these things were starting to become more clear. It was hard to tell from the image, but it appeared like there were six or maybe even seven nozzles on the end of the device which attached to the piston. There's no freaking way I'm seeing what I think I am here. Even now, I still barely believe it. This is way too genius. In the next flyover image gallery, while Ship 20 was on the ground rigged up and awaiting the first ever full stack that would take place the next day, the suspected QDs were being ready to move out to the launch site. One week later, after Booster 4 was removed from the orbital launch mount following the first full stack, the suspected QDs appeared on top of the OLM deck. Wow, all right, so this is real. Those were way too large to be pistons for the hold down arms. This is insane. Are they gonna be fueling the booster through the outer 20 engines or is it something else? I wasn't really sure on the answer still. However, this was getting more exciting by the moment. The one thing that didn't make sense to me still was how do these connect to the Raptor engines? From what I remember during the lifting event, none of the engines had anything that looked like this QD that could plug into, so maybe I'm missing something. Oh, oh snap, there it is. It looks like only seven out of the 20 outer engines had them installed, which is why I didn't notice it the first time. 
Wow, this is incredible. It's not for fueling the booster at all. Each of these pipes run down towards another area of the engine, not up towards the fuel tanks. And there are at least six of them, possibly seven. The one in the center is a locator pin to help guide the connector into place. I quickly pulled up the only diagram I had of a Raptor engine, which was created by Elise Maslov. Even though this is probably not 100% accurate, especially now that we're on version 2 of the Raptor engine, it should be close enough to still allow us to make some decent educated guesses here. So while this diagram is showing a Raptor 1 engine, the overall principle should be the same for Raptor 2 as well. Let's see if we can figure out which of these inputs and outputs we can rule out. Zooming in on the diagram, we can quickly eliminate anything related to thrust vector control, which is abbreviated as TVC. This is a feature that only exists on the center engines, not the outer 20. Next, we can remove liquid oxygen and liquid methane because we know those come from the propellant tanks. Pretty much everything else could be included in this QD, minus the methane and liquid oxygen tank pressurization lines, but I'm going to leave those on here for now. In order to try and narrow this down even further, I figured the best place to start the investigation would be to figure out where SpaceX could store large amounts of gases. Looking at the tank farm literally on top of the roof of the closest structure to the launch mount, we find out that answer pretty much immediately. This is referred to as the fluids bunker. Initially, I thought those tanks were only responsible for filling up COPVs on the Starship and Booster, so I hadn't really paid them much attention. But now, everything had changed. Digging through some images from Starship Gazer, I was able to locate a picture of the top of the bunker taken back when it was still possible to see the roof of this building from the ground. Looking at it from left to right, we have 200 bar storage on the left panel and GN2 recharge on the other panel. Moving further to the right side, on the other two panels, we see 400 bar storage on the left panel and what appears to be GCH4, or gaseous methane recharge, on the right side. On the left side, we have a small bank of gaseous oxygen, which we can just barely make out thanks to this image from Starship Gazer, and next to that, a large gaseous helium storage. There is also a backup helium tanker on the ground next to the bunker. Here is a nicely labeled version of it, thanks to Procky, who is a fellow member of the RGV aerial photography team. Putting two and two together, these control panels are responsible for filling the compressed gas cylinders to the desired pressures. They also control the discharge of those gases as it's sent out of the canisters, up the legs of the OLM, and then into the distribution manifolds inside of the launch platform. All right, let's talk practical applications here. What does all of this mean, and why is it so damn exciting? Well, the important thing to consider here is what is required in order to start a Raptor engine. Let's use Booster 3 as an example. Booster 3 was unique because it only had three engines. In order to start up these three engines, there were two large COPVs mounted to the side of the tank. There were two additional COPVs up top, mounted on opposite sides of each other, but we're going to ignore those because I'm pretty sure they were likely used for cold gas thrusters, which were later abandoned after Tim Dodd told Elon Musk that he didn't like them. Anyways, since Booster 4 has way more engines than BN3, if COPVs were responsible for starting up all 29 engines, I would expect to see nearly 10 times more of them, so about 20 in total. Considering that the gimbling engines in the center have to relight for boost back burn, and also 1-3 to three engines during the landing burn, SpaceX will probably need additional COPVs in order to account for that, so let's just say 24 to be safe. Can you imagine what that kind of outfit would have looked like on Booster 4? Since the booster is only responsible for lighting the center 9 engines, we actually end up with a COPV loadout that looks more like this. 8 COPVs mounted in groups of 2 around the bottom of the liquid oxygen tank. Alright, with that out of the way, let's wrap up this history lesson so we can talk about Booster 7. So, after Booster 4 was taken off of the launch mount after the first full stack, I said there were several important things that happened. First was the Everyday Astronaut Starbase tour, which I just went on a long rant about. And second was that Booster 4 was sent into the high bay, and 14 out of the 20 Raptor engines were removed and sent back to the McGregor testing facility. This was a pretty infamous night for Starship fans because Nick and Sweeney sat outside in his car all night catching the serial numbers of every single Raptor engine that was removed. Each of these Raptors were sent back to McGregor. At the time, the leading theory was that a lot of the Raptors were brought to Starbase without being static fire tested. This was partially true, but the more important reason was that they were sent back to McGregor so the Raptor QDs could be installed on all of the engines that didn't have them already. While this was happening, the Raptor QDs for the outer 20 engines, which had previously been staged on top of the launch mount, were all installed in less than a week. At the same time this was happening, another new piece was rolled out of the ground fabrication building and transported to the launch site. That same day, Starship Gazer caught one of them as they were being lifted into place on the orbital launch mount. Seeing it from this perspective helped me understand things a little better. There seemed to be a location for a piston or a strut to be attached so that it would open and close the door. 
Searching back through the RGB aerial images, I was able to find all 20 struts on a pallet waiting to be installed. I still didn't understand how the hold down arm, Raptor QD, and hood would all work together until I came across a picture from Nick and Sweeney that I somehow missed during the original rollout. In this picture, you can see a small frame attached to the hold down arm. This frame reaches around the wall and is connected directly to the back plate or the shield that we mentioned earlier. The strut is attached to the shield as well as the upper mounting point on the hood. When you put all of this together, this is what you are left with. In this render from Ryan Hansen Space, you can see what this entire mechanism looks like. There are a few important pieces missing here, like the reach around arm, but that's okay, because the overall concept is clearly visible. While the Raptor QDs were being installed, the booster quick disconnect frame was also lifted on top of the launch mount. This one came as a surprise because I never actually saw it until it was lifted into place. I'm assuming it was constructed in this building and then sent straight to the launch complex as soon as it was completed. Alright, so between the dates of August 11th and 23rd, all 14 Raptors that left Starbase were upfitted with QD panels, returned back to Starbase, and then reinstalled on Booster 4. Of course, Nick was ready when they arrived. Immediately visible to me here was the shiny QD panel on the top of the engine. The next time Booster 4 rolled out to the launch site, it looked much different if you knew what to look for. In this view from Cosmic Perspective, as the booster was airborne, you can see all of the taped up Raptor QDs. This time around, no Starship was needed for the testing procedure. On September 8th, 2021, Booster 4 was lifted back onto the launch mount for the second time for the sole purpose of aligning QDs. Not only did all 20 Raptor Quick Disconnects have to be verified to align with the outer 20 engines, but also the Booster Quick Disconnect had to be aligned and fit tested as well before all the cryogenic flex hoses could be installed. I'm going to skip how all the plumbing on the inside of this launch table works today, or else we will be here for a very long time. I've already covered it in past Twitter articles to some degree, so feel free to go back and find them. But I feel like if I get into this too deeply today, I'll end up constantly looking over my shoulder from here on. It's no way to live being constantly afraid that some rogue foreign nation will abduct me while I'm walking outside one night on the Chicago Riverwalk or something, and then force me to build one of these stage zeros for them. Plus, it would be really hard to explain that to my boss at work when they finally return me. Hey Brad, it's me, Zach. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I know, man. It's been a while, huh? Um, hey, listen, I know this might sound crazy, but just, just, just hear me out, okay? Hear me out. What I will say, though, is that over the following two months after Booster 4 was taken off the launch mount for the second time, the maze of pipework inside of the launch mount got even crazier once SpaceX crews began connecting all of the Raptor cuties to the supply manifolds. There were six stainless steel flex hoses connected to the back of the QDs, which delivered the high pressure startup gases to the engines. There are also six black hydraulic hoses as well. You can see this even better in nighttime images once all of the work lights are activated. The two largest black hydraulic hoses run to the newly installed linear actuators for extending and retracting the hold down arms, which means no more manual deployment of the clamps while lifting the booster on and off of the launch mount. You can just barely see the new actuator in this image. It's mounted onto a double U-shaped bracket, and it's incredibly small considering how big of a job it performs. There are also two smaller hoses for actuating the Raptor QDs, and another even smaller set of hoses for actuating the clamp on the end of the hold down arms. If you multiply that by 20 stations, there are at least 240 flex hoses hanging from the ceiling of this launch mount. Seriously, I don't know how they're able to even walk around in there. After this was complete, it was time to get down to business. The first tests of this RQD system were a surprise to us. On November 21st, the first purge test of a single QD was performed. This test confirmed that SpaceX should be able to ignite the outer 20 engines one at a time if they desire for static fire purposes. This could also allow for a staggered engine startup to reduce the shock on the vehicle or to launch without one of the engines running at all. A few days later, we saw a purge test of what appeared to be all 20 RQDs at the same time. But I'm still pretty positive that this was just one out of the six nozzles on the RQD being tested. If we look at the RQD panel on the Raptor, you can see that there are four small ports, a medium sized one in the top left corner, and then a large one on the bottom right. Each of these nozzles will likely have a different volumetric flow rate and pressure, so we should be able to see a noticeable difference in flow during these boosterless spin start tests. When we compare the previous two tests side by side and slow it down a little, you can see it pretty clearly. One thing I was wondering as I was watching this was, how do they know if all of them are activating at the same time? I feel like that would be pretty important to know. Just like making sure the clamps on the launch mount all release at the same time like we talked about a few episodes ago. 
Well, crazy enough, I think I got my answer to this the very next week when on December 6th, future astronaut Anna Almeida was out hiking in Boca Chica, minding her own business when all of a sudden she found herself face to face with Mechazilla. Hopefully by now you all understand that the launch mount is definitely part of what we call Mechazilla. In my opinion, the tower is the body, the tank farm, fluids control bunker, and comms building are the heart and central nervous system, and last but not least, the launch mount with its high pressure gaseous spray would be, um, well, I still gotta think of something to compare that to. Looking at these amazing photos from Anna, I was really blown away at how much bigger everything looks when you're really close up to it. Out of all these amazing photos she took, however, the one that caught my eye the most was this one right here. This is a rather famous image in my opinion because it's the first clear image of the Raptor cuties that we ever got after they were installed. Most people who know about these Raptor cuties prior to my explaining them today, found out about them as a result of this image, which was taken roughly four months after Sam Patel's info dump. It was shown for the first time on Marcus House's weekly video sometime around December 11th of last year, which I have linked in the comments if you would like to check it out. When we look at these closely, they look pretty intense. Anyone else getting Matrix vibes looking at this, or am I the only one? I didn't understand what was going on here until a few weeks later when Mauricio from RGV Aerial got an updated photo of the RQDs without the sensors attached to them. From what I can tell, it appears that in the first image, Anna happened to catch the RQDs while they were in the middle of some kind of test. I think the attached sensors are most likely some kind of flow meter or pressure transducer that would allow them to dial in the performance of each of the RQDs individually. Less than two weeks later, we saw evidence to back this theory up when one of the first ever igniter tests was carried out while Booster 4 was on the launch mount for its third time. At first, I wasn't really sure if this was an accident or part of the plan, but then it happened again. Let's take a listen to that one more time, but this time pay attention to the sound that comes before the ignition. Even though we're unable to see it, we can definitely hear the gas is being forced into the engine. One thing I forgot to mention is that the igniter system for the Outer 20 Raptor Boost engines is controlled by these panels on the side of the launch mount. These panels are responsible for regulating the pressure and volumetric flow rate going into three out of the seven distribution manifolds inside of the launch mount. You can see a gaseous oxygen igniter panel next to another one for gaseous methane and then a third for nitrogen. I think this one is used for purging out the system. After these tests were complete, the RQD purge tests got stepped up to the next level. You can tell pretty much immediately that this is all 120 gas nozzles being activated at the same time. At this point, it seemed like things were running pretty smoothly with this system. And for the first time ever, SpaceX finally acknowledged the existence of this system publicly when they posted this epic short clip on Twitter, which ended with a spin start test on the orbital launch mount. I have no idea how they timed this shot so perfectly, but this was some pretty great cinematography. Unfortunately, it's too far away for us to finally get a clear image of what this looks like. So instead, I asked Corey from Seabase Productions to put together a few animations to show us what this spin start cyclone test would look like when viewed from a few different angles. Straight up, I can probably sit here and watch these animations all day long. And hopefully you all can finally understand why Stage Zero Zack is so obsessed with this system now. There is a massive amount of complexity thanks to all the moving parts and the 120 nozzles that have to work together in order to successfully reach the first stage separation event, which occurs at T minus zero. Creating a system this advanced is never gonna be done perfectly the first time though, and there are bound to be accidents along the way. Speaking of accidents, as we all know, Booster 4 was not fit to be the first orbital test flight candidate. I'm gonna avoid talking about why that was once again. Instead, just like SpaceX, Let's move on to more exciting things, like Booster 7. Now, Booster 7 has always had a troubled life. It all started when the header tank transfer tube collapsed during a simulated reentry burn test on the orbital cryo station. I'll tell you what, if I ever meet Booster 7, I'm gonna thank him. Cause if not for this event, it would have taken me much longer to get the confidence in order to start this YouTube channel. The response to this video when we located the moment of failure for that header tank gave me the motivation I needed in order for us to reach the point where we are today. Anyways, after this event, it had to be transported back to the build site and repaired. After the repairs were complete and another cryo test was performed in order to verify that the surgery was successful, we later saw one of the first major evolutions in Raptor development as B7 came back to the launch site with 33 Raptor 2s installed. This is when we finally got to witness the evolution of the Raptor 2 engine. 
In the Everyday Astronauts' most recent Starbase tour, Elon mentioned that the torch igniters on the main combustion chamber were eliminated, but avoided explaining how they were replaced. How do you, um, how's it light then? <laughs> well, that's a secret sauce. As Elon was explaining all of these details, I started wondering, how are they going to make all of these changes to the engine while keeping the Raptor QD the same? Surely they're going to have to redesign that as well, right? Sure enough, when I scrolled back to find a glimpse of one of the new Raptor boost engines just so I could check out the QD panel, I was able to answer my own question. Even though it's taped up, you can clearly see that the large hole which was previously located on the bottom right of the QD panel has now been moved up to the top center on the newer design. On March 25th, the day after Booster 4 was taken off of the launch mount for the final time, SpaceX crews immediately removed all 20 Raptor QDs on the launch mount in order to upgrade them to support the new design. The first clue this was happening was the appearance of this steel beam right here. Might not look like much, but this is the lifting jig that SpaceX uses to perform maintenance on the QDs. Once it's lifted on top of the table, the brackets on the bottom of the jig attach to the QD in order to remove it. Thanks to these images from C. Nunez, we can just barely see the lifting jig hiding behind the booster alignment pin on top of the launch mount. In another angle, we can see that all 120 flex hoses were also removed for this upgrade. With the flex hose out of the way, it's possible to see through the launch mount and view the arms that the Raptor QDs used to be attached to. As you can see, all of the QDs were taken out of their holsters so they could be changed out. Just a few weeks later, Carlos was also the first to get a picture of it once they were reinstalled again. By April 25th, the upgrades had been completed and SpaceX performed a few more purge tests just to verify everything was good to go. With pre-commissioning of the new Raptor 2 QDs completed, it was time for SpaceX to start getting serious with integration testing on the entire system. By this time, Booster 7 had all 33 engines now installed and was ready to roll back to the launch site. The plan was to finally commence the first ever static fire test on the orbital launch mount, but there were a few things that had to be completed before that could happen. First, SpaceX had to test out the new igniter system on the new Raptor 2 engines. Check out the difference in sound between the old igniter test and the new one. Listening to Starship 24 as it performs the same test, it obviously sounds the same, just quieter. This is probably because we're only hearing the center three engines being tested, followed by the three RVACs. On the booster igniter test, it was much louder as all 33 engines were tested in what I believe was four different consecutive groupings. As you can tell, with the torch igniters removed, there was no explosion present during these igniter tests anymore. Just because there was no explosion doesn't mean there aren't highly combustible gases present. As we showed earlier, the igniter system uses gaseous oxygen and methane. I suppose that's pretty obvious, but the reason I mention it is because testing this system involves an unknown amount of gaseous methane, which, if there were a flame source present, would likely cause it to ignite or explode. There's really no way around that reality. Remember that for later. Let's also note that this igniter test can be done without any liquid oxygen or methane in the propellant tanks, which is why this test can be performed without an overpressure warning or even a road closure. Anyways, with igniter tests complete, it was time to test the other important procedure needed for engine startup. The igniter system isn't the only function of those Raptor QDs. They are also responsible for spinning up both turbo pumps, which is necessary before the actual ignition of the engine in order to make sure that the internal plumbing of the engine is fully primed with liquids. In this render from Seabass Productions, which I've linked in the description, you can see a visualization of the process that I'm talking about. Under no circumstances do you want anything other than fluid inside of these turbo pumps while they're spinning. The presence of a gas bubble is detrimental for these components. An air bubble impacting a turbine while it's spinning at these speeds can be just as damaging as a rock. By turning the turbo pump turbines, fluid can be moved through the entire engine so that once it's fully ignited, everything starts up smoothly without instantly ripping itself to pieces. If you want to learn more about pump cavitation, there's a pretty awesome video from Mountain State Engineering and Controls linked in the description. Let's first look at a spin prime test on the Starship to see what it looks like in real life. Unlike the igniter test, which you wouldn't know was happening if you didn't have the audio playing at the time, this one is super obvious. You can see that they first spin up the center three engines, followed shortly by the three RVACs. As exciting as this was, a few weeks later, it was time for Booster 7 to do the same as well. Sir, I have some good news to report. It appears that everything has been checked off on the list. The only thing remaining is to issue the overpressure notice. No. But sir. The overpressure is the notice. <laughs> Leading up to the spin prime test, you can see a large amount of venting coming from below the skirt as the engine pre-chill sequence was underway. 
It's important to note that this venting is not coming from the actual main combustion chamber as it appears. In this view from Lab Padre taken during a previous testing event, you can see that the Raptor chill venting is actually coming from above the engines. Looking at Booster 4 again with its Raptor 1s, it's easy to see where it's coming from. In this picture from Cosmic Perspective, you will notice the four little pipes on the top of the engine bell. These pipes connect to a panel just above the rim of the thermal protection shielding. Once you see it, it's kind of hard to unsee simply due to how many of them there are. Check it out from below. You can see each of the ports even with the remaining thermal protection in place. On Booster 7, with its Raptor 2 engines, it's a little harder to spot. The shape of the panel was changed and is now a small square panel instead of the long rectangular one. The outer 20 Raptor Boost engines have this drain port pointing down at an angle. The angle that they are mounted causes a pretty cool swirling effect once the pre-chill flow is turned on. This pre-chill venting is more than likely made up of almost entirely liquid oxygen. Ideally, the methane tank would be filled with liquid nitrogen during this test, so once the spin prime starts, I believe we should see both nitrogen and oxygen dumping out of the bottom of the engine bell as they are forced out of the main combustion chamber. So if this is the case, then we shouldn't really be at risk of any explosions here, right? Wrong. So how does this even happen without methane in the booster? Well, remember that in order to spin up the turbo pumps, there is a combination of gaseous methane, oxygen, helium, and nitrogen that is forced out of the Raptor QDs and into the engine. All of that gas has to go somewhere. When you look at a normal startup of a Raptor 2, that ignition happens so quickly that it's almost impossible to see the initial spin up unless you significantly slow down the video. It's less than a fraction of a second before the engine appears to be fully ignited. So when you compare that to what we see during the booster spin prime test, it's nearly three seconds of consistent spin up before this explosion takes place. By comparison, that's an incredibly long time to keep those turbines spinning without igniting them. It makes sense that this would need to be tested at least once to make sure that all 20 RQDs are synced up and that the internal pressures inside of the engine are reaching the values expected for a safe startup. A longer test like this might be necessary in order to collect enough data for SpaceX to feel confident in the system's performance. So here's a hypothetical question. What would happen if SpaceX were to perform an igniter test at the same time as the spin prime? Not only would this add even more gaseous methane into the mixture, but there is a possibility that the torch igniters inside of the pre-burners could be active even though we can't hear anything that sounds like an explosion while the igniter system is being tested. So with the turbo pumps spinning at high velocity and approaching engine startup speed, if an unexpected igniter test were to occur, I think there might be a risk of flames from either turbo pump to make their way into the main combustion chamber where upon contact with the large methane cloud surrounding the launch mount, Honestly, I highly doubt something like this would ever happen, but in my opinion, when you step through this frame by frame, you can see the brightest part of the explosion starting from up under the skirt and then quickly traveling down to the ground. It seems to me like there's a possibility that this explosion may have actually originated from inside of the skirt. I think the best view of this event actually came from Kevin Randolph from the What About It channel. Kevin, also known as Chief, appears to have been recording this event at a higher frame rate than everyone other than SpaceX that day. Because of this, we're able to slow it down enough to actually see the initial flashpoint. Oh, damn. Okay. Oh, no. If we're looking for the source of this explosion, I would say look no further than Booster 7's rear end. I've reviewed this many times, and in multiple views, it appears to me that for several seconds, visible through the intense light is a solid column of flames that is much brighter than everything else. In my opinion, this looks like the center 13 engines were actively shooting flames out of the bottom of the engine bells at this moment but maybe I'm crazy. Let me know what you guys think about all this in the comments. So after this, SpaceX crews began cleaning up the launch site, and on July 12th, Starship Gazer took this image once a little more of the debris were cleaned up and you could really get a good view of all the surrounding damage. It's pretty obvious that the legs looked absolutely horrible, but that was largely cosmetic. On top of the launch mount, however, several of the control box panels for various electronics were caved in slightly. Getting a glance inside, we can see that some of the electrical equipment in here appears to be damaged as well. Anyways, before they took the booster off the launch mount, we knew there would be some damage to the skirt, but when we finally saw it once it was lifted off of the table, God dang. Well, this is pretty interesting damage pattern to say the least. In particular, from this side of the vehicle, you can see at least four panels which have been completely blown off. Almost all of the ones that are still attached are showing signs of damage as well. Later that night when the booster was rolled back to the build site for repairs, as it passed Lab Padre's Rover 2 camera, you could see that on the front side of the booster, there were even more of them missing. At least five missing curved panels are visible here. 
The damaged panels were pretty disappointing to see, but it's important to remember that this could have likely been a lot worse. Given the fact that there isn't much space in between the launch mount and the skirt of the booster, I'm almost wondering if this explosion could have originated inside of the skirt itself. While the booster was in the high bay having all of its center engines removed, crews began repairing the damage to the launch mount. I'm going to skip the cosmetic repairs because paint's kind of boring. What I care about more than anything is seeing additional protection installed onto the launch mount to prevent more damage in the event something like this were to ever happen again in the future. Well, if you're following CSI Starbase on Twitter, then you're probably already aware by now that SpaceX has finally started upgrading the exterior of the launch mount with some additional protection. Um, it's not what I was expecting, but it's a start. This bank vault looking shield for the control panel was installed last week, shortly before Booster 7 was rolled back to the launch site. I noticed the panels shortly after they were constructed in the ground fabrication building. Returning viewers to this channel already knew that this was going to happen at some point, so with that being said, the SpaceX cover-up is still underway. Speaking of cover-ups, if not for this explosion, we would have never seen the Raptor 2 engines in their complete form. I expect this may be one of the last times we ever see this until the shroud is completely removed in the future versions. Looking closely, we can finally see the new design of the Raptor 2 QD panel in crisp detail. One thing to note is that there is now an extra port on the QD. There are seven in total, six small holes and one large one, plus the large one in the center for the alignment pin. Another detail we never get to see when Raptors are out in the open are the red and silver tubes that run down the right side of the engine. At the bottom, you can see a double-sided ventilation fitting attached at the end. This is most likely a CO2 or nitrogen purge for the engine shroud. This is something Elon mentioned would be added, but we've never actually seen it until now. In fact, if the three panels that go in between these four engines were present, we wouldn't even know they're there. This system, if active, should have prevented an explosion inside of the engine shroud from taking place. On the launch mount itself, there is a similar nitrogen purge system directly beneath the engine bells. You can see it here in that shot from RGV ground drill that we were looking at earlier. You have to zoom in closely to notice, but this pipe which circles the entire perimeter of the inside of the launch mount has tiny pinholes which I'm assuming would allow for nitrogen to be forced out upwards in a pretty powerful jet. I imagine if this was active, we would see a pretty similar effect like the one we saw in Ship 24 during its static fire test. If you look closely, you can see tons of air rushing upward from the bottom of the vehicle. Anyways, before we wrap up this episode, I want to talk about one final important change that we have seen on the launch mount. This one started shortly before the first static fire test on the OLM last week. If you were watching the static fires, you would have noticed a new vent on the side of the table that we have never seen before. We watched this pretty closely, and to me it was clear that the engine chill venting that used to be underneath the engine skirt has now been relocated outside of the table. During the second static fire test, a different engine was fired, and we saw yet another new vent come out of another location. Thanks to these images from Starship Gazer, we were able to locate at least 14 more of these vents around the table by the time of this episode. It's safe to say there will likely be at least 20 of these. This will create a pretty interesting effect when all 20 of the outer engines are in Raptor chill mode at the same time. The launch mount will look like the eye of a hurricane when viewed from above. Tracing these lines out, we can see that they go underneath the launch mount and then back up the inner wall. We don't know this for sure, but I have a feeling that these extended Raptor chill vent lines are actually being connected directly to the outer 20 Raptor engines. If they were connected to the RQD port, then I would expect them to originate from inside of the launch mount. If you remember the drain ports that I showed you earlier, if we look at those and then look at the ones on the outside of the launch mount, they're basically identical. So with that being said, I think that this might just be a temporary fix until they're able to upgrade the Raptor QD yet again. I hope I'm wrong, but only time will tell on this one. Either way, this is yet another example of SpaceX working incredibly fast to solve any unforeseen problems that come up during the first orbital test campaign. While it might seem like they're kind of crazy sometimes, I think that they have consistently proven that they have what it takes in order to pull this off. Wow, that was quite the long episode. And honestly, this one took a lot of effort to put together. So I want to thank everybody who was able to make it all the way through to the end especially those of you who didn't skip through the commercials because that goes a long way into helping support the channel since we currently do not have a sponsor for the show. For those of you interested in supporting the channel even further, you can do so by becoming a monthly member on Patreon where you can also get access to the CSI Starbase Discord server. If you aren't able to access Patreon for some reason, don't worry because you can also become a CSI Starbase YouTube channel member or donate via PayPal as well. You can find the links to each of those in the description. I also want to give a huge shout out to those of you who have already supported the channel so far, 
because it's allowing us to slowly upgrade our equipment so that we can continue to increase the quality of these episodes every single week. Your support also allows us to reinvest back into the photographers who are out there every single day capturing all of this amazing footage. Last but not least, I can't end this episode without saying a huge thank you to all of the 3D artists who created renders just for this episode, and also to all of the photographers who had to dig deep into their archives in order to provide us with the footage that we needed to tell the story. So with that, thank you again, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you all next time. Stage Zero Zach, signing out.